about y'all, but we're fired up for praise and worship this morning. Are y'all fired up for God this morning? Wish I could tell you, but I can't describe it. I can't contain it. I can't keep it to myself. There aren't enough colors to paint the whole picture. Not enough words to ever say what I feel. Wonderful and beautiful and glorious and holy he is merciful, powerful. Who we talking about? That's my king. We deserve the glory. Give him all the honor. All together worthy. Who we talking about? That's my king. There's no one before you. Yes, we will adore you. All of this is for you. Who we talking about? That's my king. I'm not letting the rocks cry without joining the chorus. There aren't enough notes to make the harmony. It's the song of the angel, listen through the ages, all of the earth and heaven's symphony. Wonderful and beautiful and glorious and holy, he is merciful and powerful. Who we talking about? That's my king. We declare the glory, give him all the honor, all together worthy. Who we talking about? That's my king. There's no one before you. Yes, we will adore you. All of this is for you. Who we talking about? That's my king. Oh, that's my king this morning. That's my king. That's my king. That's my God. That's my shepherd. My protector, that's my king, that's my rock, that's my anchor, my defender, that's my king, that's my God, that's my shepherd, my protector, that's my king, that's my rock. That's my anchor, my defender. That's my king. We the glory. Give him all the honor, all together worthy. Who we talking about? That's my king. We declare the glory. Give him all the honor, all together worthy. Who we talking about? That's my king. There's no one before you. Yes, we will adore you. All of this is for you. Who we talking about? That's my king. Oh, that's my king. Sing it with us, church. That's my king. That's my God. That's my shepherd. My protector. That's my king. That's my rock, that's my anchor, my defender. That's my king, that's my God, that's my shepherd, my protector. That's my king, that's my rock, that's my anchor, my defender. That's my king, come on. We together glory, give him all the honor, all together worthy. Who we talking about? That's my king. All of them glory, give him all the glory, give him all the glory. Who we talking about? That's my king. Yes, we will adore you. All of this is for you. Who we talking about? That's my king. Oh, 
that's my key I don't know about y'all, but we're about ready for a revival here in the River Valley. Everybody ready for a revival? Oh, I feel it. I feel it coming. There. Oh, yeah. Everybody get to the back of the van Down by the river there's an old church man Singing a song, clapping along We all gonna see a revival Oh, muddy water gonna wash your sins Tell everybody to bring their friends Hold on tight, it might last all night We're gonna see a revival When that choir starts singing And that chorus rises That old preacher preaching said Souls on fire All day and through the night We're gonna get back to the Bible Anybody lost wanna get saved Get found, come down The Big Ten Revival Come on down to the Big Ten Holy Ghost power gonna set you free it don't matter if it takes all week Fire from heaven running down like rain Ain't nobody here walking out the same Signs and wonders, trumpet sounds Riding out of here on a glory cloud Get out of your seats, get on your feet We all gonna have a revival When that choir starts singing And that chorus rises That'll preach a preaching set Souls on fire we're gonna get back to the Bible Anybody lost wanna get saved Get found, come down The Big Ten Revival Come on down to the Big Ten Everybody get in the back of the van Down by the river there's an old church band Singing a song, clapping along We are all about to see a revival When that choir starts singing And that chorus rises That old preacher preaching Set souls on fire All day and through the night We're gonna get back to the Bible Anybody lost wanna get saved Get found, calm down Well, anybody lost gonna get saved Get found, calm down The Big Ten Revival The Big Ten Revival So everybody get down Tell the whole town Everybody get down To the Big Ten Everybody get down Tell the whole town, everybody get down To the Big Ten, everybody get down Tell the whole town, everybody get down To the Big Ten We can't stop there, I don't think, church, come on Holy Ghost power gonna set you free It don't matter if it takes all week Fire from heaven running down like rain Ain't nobody here walking out the same Signs and wonders, trumpet sounds Riding out of here on a glory cloud Get out of your seats, get on your feet We are all about to have a revival And that choir starts singing And that chorus rises That old preacher, preacher said Souls on fire All day and through the night We're gonna get back to revival Everybody lost, wanna get saved Get found, come down The Big Ten Revival Come on down to the Big Ten Oh, now Everybody get in the 
the back of the van Down by the river there's an old church band Singing a song, laughing along We are all about to see a revival When that choir starts singing And that chorus rises That old preacher preaching said Souls on fire all day through the night We're gonna get back to the Bible Anybody lost wanna get saved, get found Tell the whole town, everybody get down To the Big Ten, everybody get down Tell the whole town, everybody get down To the Big Ten, everybody get down Tell the whole town, everybody get down To the Big Ten Who tells the sun to shine every morning Colors the sky with shades of its glory Wakes us with mercy and love Jesus does Who holds the orphan, comforts the widow Cries for injustice Feels ever sorrow, brings his pain of his children. Jesus does. Praise to the Father who gave us the Son. Praise to the Spirit. When I was a sinner. The heart of a sinner showers his grace over all our mistakes, washes us clean with his blood. Jesus does. Who sings a song of sweet forgiveness? Who stole the key to hell and the grave? the power to say Jesus does We sing praise to the Father who gave us the Son Praise to the Spirit When I was a sinner
Oh, isn't it great to know we got a Savior this morning that we can just leave it all behind? When times get tough and you don't think you can go any further, all you got to do is leave it to Him and go to the well this morning. Leave it all behind. Leave it all behind. Leave it all behind. Leave it all behind. I have what you need, but you keep on searching. I've done all the work. But you keep on working when well, you're running on empty and you can't find a remedy. Just come to the well. You can spend your whole life chasing what's missing, but that empty inside. Oh, just ain't gonna listen when nothing can satisfy and the world leaves you high and dry. Just come to the will. And all who thirst will thirst no more. And all who search will their souls long for the world will try but it can never feel so leave it all behind and come to the will sit bring me your heart no matter how Broken. Just come as you are When your last prayer is spoken And rest in my arms a while You feel the change, my child When you come to the will And all who thirst will thirst no What their souls long for The world will try But it can never feel So leave it all behind And come to the will Oh, leave it all behind But it can never feel So leave it all behind And now that you're full Of love beyond measure Your joy is gonna flow Just like a stream in the desert And soon all the world will see Living water is found in me when you come to the well. And all who thirst will thirst no more. All who search will find what their souls long for. The world will try. But it can never feel So leave it all behind And come to the way
Just leave it all behind. Leave it all behind. Leave it all behind. Just leave it all behind. And come to the wind. Yes, give him a big round of applause in this place today. Amen. Oh, I even like that whistle. I love it. I love it. I like it when you're excited for Jesus. Well, today is a special day. Lisa, you can stay for this if you'd like to. I would like for our graduates to come up, and Brother Tim as well, to come. And this is, this is a really, really good time that uh, I always love sharing. This is something we haven't got to do in some time because in our youth group, I think we got seven or eight next year that will be graduating. And this is the only two that we have that is graduating this year out of our youth group. Uh, and they are, these boys are very special to me. You know this one is. Uh, He's part of the chip off the old block. But I, when I look at these two guys, they are at the opposite end of the spectrum. This boy is real reserved. That one is real outgoing. <laughs> Out, outgoing. And that, that's not, uh, I'm not saying that's bad. I'm saying that's good. There's nothing wrong with that, being real outgoing. But... These boys, they mean a lot to old Pastor James. And I want to tell you why they mean so much to me, mean so much to me is because not only yesterday, but I want to speak specifically of yesterday, one of the young ladies of our youth group who was at our tent that we are mentoring, Brother Tim is mentoring, I'm doing my best to help mentor in that was at the tent yesterday and when the lady come by and she had three children and we were talking to them and she said, if you can get my husband to go to church, I hadn't even asked him to go to church. I was telling him about Jesus. I was telling him about Jesus and church to take care of itself. She said, if you can get that guy over there to go to church, I'll be there in autumn stepped up, and this is what she said. She said, if you'll come to church tomorrow, I'll work in the nursery, and I'll take care of your children. Amen. That is part of mentorship. And I told her, I said, you're, what you said is just as important as my part because of what that she has been taught already is soaking in about being a disciple and serving. These two young boys, I've been, he's been in my life for 18 years. He's been in my life for about three years, I guess, right now. And the other night, I got to hold Gage in my arms and pray over him Wednesday night. And after I got through praying for him, he said, how did you know that? I said, I don't know nothing. And he told me about the place that he lived. And I prayed that he would be a light. Is that the truth? Is that what I said? I prayed that he would be a light in a dark place. And I have saw this boy make so much progress. And now, He's going to be moving out of the youth group, moving into the new class because he is at that stage in life. But guys, I want you, Brother Tim, get that microphone. Have you already got it? We're going to share the mic with these guys for just a moment. I want you to read this verse. Tell them the the. Chapter, chapter and verse and everything. 
and read it to Brayden. All right. Are you ready for this? All right. Philippians 1 6. I, and I am sure of this that he who began a good work in you will bring it to be completion and at the day of Christ. Now, Brayden, read that one to him. Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Amen. Growing these young men is so important to this church. They're not the church of the tomorrow. They are the church today. Right this very moment, Brother Tim is going to pray over these guys. That God will bless you in your life, in your next step. When God closes one door, he always opens another. Remember that, Brother Tim. Father, I pray over these young men. Just as my wife prays over plants, as she plants them and she nurtures the soil and she's on her knees, she's praying to God over each plant. We see the fruit prosper from that. Father, right now we are on our knees symbolically this morning in behalf of the seeds that have been planted in the hearts of these two young men. That as they continue their journey and they enter into the next chapter of their life, that they would continue to seek you first in everything that they do. And you said in your word that you would bless whatever they put their hands to do. So Father, we're standing with them they are not alone. They're not entering this next, next chapter alone. They have a church family that loves them and family that supports them. But more than that, they have you in their heart that has been planted there. And you said you would never leave them nor forsake them. That You were like a, brother that's, a friend that sticks closer than a brother. So, Father, as they enter this next chapter, we just speak blessings. We speak prosperity. And, Father, through times when they might get discouraged, we speak restoration over their lives, over their hearts, over everything that they do as they enter into the next chapter. Father, we just thank you, Father, for these young men. We thank you for the blessing they have been to us. We ask that you continue to help us to be a blessing to them. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. As a token from Restoration Church, Pastor Tim and myself. <laughs> There's also a table set up out at front. If you would like to, I will ask them to go out at front when I get ready to close this morning. I'm talking about the last time that I get ready to close. So when you, when you, get ready, when you go outside, they have a table set up there. If you'd like to have your picture taken with them and like to pick up a card, they invite you to do that. God bless you guys. We love you. Appreciate you. Thank you, Pastor Tim. I would like to say that it's so good to have everybody with us today. Children, you are dismissed to go to your class. Now, if you are a visitor, we are so proud to have you. Autumn, if you would like to go on back into the nursery and you can help some of those that are back there, that would be appreciated. If you have your Bibles today and you want to read with me, go to the book of Mark. We've been in the Gospels, in the four Gospels for the last month now. And I don't know how long I'm going to stay there. I'll stay there until I feel that the good Lord is ready to, for me to move on. Mark chapter 5, starting reading at verse 21. I would like for our church to give our special guests, all of our guests, a round of applause. As part of our discipleship and evangelism, we appreciate you so much for being here today. Also, I want to say that it's so good to have, we had an entire family here with us this morning. Tabitha had her children with her today. 
and it is so good to have them. I believe they're back in the nursery, but we're so proud to have them. Are you ready for the preaching of God's Word? I know I'm ready. I love every minute of it. The Word says this. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders by the name of Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. And he pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed immediately. Immediately. You get that word? Immediately. Her bleeding stopped and she felt her body as she felt in her body that she was free from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him and he turned around in the crowd. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding around against you? His disciples answered, and yet you ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth and nothing but the truth. That part wasn't in there. He said to her, listen to this, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be free from your suffering. Let us pray. Father, we thank you today for another chance that I have to get to deliver the Word of God. Lord, it's such an honor to stand up here today before such a wonderful group of people and tell them about Jesus because that's my heart. It's my compassion. Lord, I pray today that you will just touch the word that you have already anointed. Just let this vessel be the same. In Christ's name we pray. Amen and amen. You may be seated. I would like to title my message today, One in the Crowd. One in the crowd. As we go through these sermons from week to week and we talk about Jesus and we see his life that he brings out in front of us, he portrays his life as an open book to the people that are around him. And you cannot look at Jesus without seeing this, his compassion. He overflows with compassion. You know why? Because that is the nature of God for his compassion to flow through him and through his healings that he presented across the area where that he was at. We could see his compassion. Matter of fact, It was because of his healings and his ministries of mercy that people crowded around him everywhere that he went. We can see that in Matthew chapter 4, reading verses 23 through 24. And I've just got part of them in my word here today. And the scripture says, and he healed every kind of disease and illness. People soon began bringing to him all who were sick. 
whatever their sickness or disease. Listen to this. It didn't make any difference if they were demon possessed or if they were epileptic or if they were paralyzed. He healed all of them. And large crowds followed him wherever that he went. Why? Why? There were religious groups in the area. There were people that was telling them in the synagogue. They were reading the books of Isaiah to some of them. But still yet, they saw something different in Jesus than they saw all to the rest of the scribes and the Pharisees. What did they see? They saw that he could exercise his authority. It's good to have authority. Don't you wish that you had the authority that Shane Jones has? The local sheriff, if you're coming through town going 90 miles an hour, he has the authority to pull you over and stop you and write you a ticket. And then he can say, I'm sorry, but you shouldn't have been going so fast. But here we see Jesus. He exercised his authority. He exercised his authority over demons, over sickness, in the forgiveness of sins. And he was so popular because of the performance of miracles that he did, that people would press through the crowd just to get to touch him. They would climb up in trees just to get a glimpse of him. The blind would sit on the side of the road and they would cry out to him, Son of David, have mercy upon me. The demon possessed, when he would get out of a boat and he would walk into a cemetery, he would touch them and he would go into the town and come back and say, I want to follow you, Jesus. And he, they would fall at his feet and honor him and worship him. One thing about Jesus, he would comfort the afflicted and he would afflict those who were comfortable. Jesus, he was not only a prophet, he was not only a priest, he was not only a king, but I like this part about Jesus. The scripture calls him Emmanuel, what me, which means that God was with us and he come and dwelt among us in the flesh. That is why that we can experience the power of the Holy Spirit in this building today because God sent his Holy Spirit through his son Jesus Christ when he went back to heaven and when he made the trip, the power of the Holy Spirit fell right here on earth. That's why he can do it. We see how all that is laid out. Why that they follow Jesus, and here we see a man by the, by the name of Jairus. Some people call him Jairus. You can call him whatever you want to. Today, I'm going to call him Jairus. A man, a popular man. A man, the scripture says, that he was a ruler of the synagogue. Well, if you're like me, and a lot of the people, you would like to know what a ruler of the synagogue would do. Here was his job description. He had the authority over the sacred treasures in the synagogue. He was responsible to oversee all the scrolls and to select the scripture reading on the Sabbath for the synagogue. However, when he came to Jesus, all of that stuff didn't matter. Him being a ruler of the synagogue, his position in his church, Right then, didn't really matter. That title that he had, it was pale in comparison to the problem that he had. It was trouble in his house that brought him to Jesus. I'm going to ask you today, how many of you, that trouble in your house is what brought you to Jesus. I was in the hospital room of a friend of mine the other day. The doctor had just came in and told him when we did 
an x-ray of you, we saw something on you that we had never seen before. He had a spot on his lung, he had a spot on his back. But I just happened to be there at the right time and I did not know that until he told me. And I looked at him and I said, have you ever accepted Jesus? A typical prayer of a non-believer. He said, well, pastor, I believe in Jesus. I believe that he was the son of God. I said, that's important. But I'm asking you, have you ever accepted Jesus? He said, no, I haven't. I said, by your own admission, you told me your grandma passed away with this and I'll never make it. So you're saying you'll never make it. And if you die without Jesus, you know where you're going. He said, I know that. See, it was trouble in his house that brought him to Jesus. But you know what? After he asked asked Jesus into his heart, I told him about the man that owned the vineyard. He sent out for workers. He went after workers himself. And he went out early in the morning. He went later in the day. Matter of fact, he went five times. And he went late in that afternoon. And there was a group of people that just worked one hour. And he told the payroll master, you pay them. And that one at the end, that one just works just one hour, gets just as much as the rest of them. I told him, I said, brother, I've been serving Jesus Christ a long time. Yes, I'll have a pastor's reward, but you accepting Jesus Christ today, you will get heaven just like I I received him. What I'm saying today, trouble in your house will bring you to God. See this high-ranking official, he fell at the feet of Jesus. And he poured out his heart and he said, my daughter, my only daughter, 12 years old, this is a point of death. In other words, he was saying, Jesus, My daughter's body is already turning to ash color. I can hear that death rattle. Like her breathing is about gone. She's dying. Time is running out. And I like this. Jaira said, if you would just come by and lay your hands on her, she, what? What's that next word? She will. You talk about positive confession. It didn't say she might be healed. There's a chance she'll be healed. He had the faith to believe she will be. Well, she will get well and she will live. So the scripture says that Jesus went with her. I like that part because I can tell you today that whatever you're going through right here at this very moment, right now, Jesus is with you. I don't care what journey you're on. I don't care what problems that you're facing. You are not by yourself. Jesus is with you. Because Isaiah chapter 43 tells us, do not be afraid. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. For I am the Lord, your God. Amen. I am the Lord, your God. So you will never Face one moment without him because Jesus is walking with you. And we see this crowd. They're following Jesus. A lot of them are just following because of curiosity. Some of them are rubbernecking to see what's going on. Some of them are concerned about Jairus' daughter. But they're all in this big crowd. I don't know how many of you have been to Israel, but... If you walk down the streets of Capernaum, you will find out that they are very, very, very narrow. 
And can you imagine this crowd that's forming following Jesus? It would be like going to a Razorback game when they're playing good. All trying to get in the gate at the same time. And now we see a woman with no name trying to get to Jesus. In this big crowd, can you imagine her? The scripture does not even give her a title. She has no name. You won't find it in any of the gospels. We don't even know where she was from. We don't even know the name of the deep disease that she was struggling with. She was just another face in the crowd. But little Miss Nobody came from nowhere. But with just one little finger of faith, she was able to stop the master in his tracks and receive one of the greatest miracles that she was going to receive or that we can ever see in the scripture. You may be sitting right here today in this crowd. Everybody may know you. Just part of the people may know you. Maybe none of the people know who you are here today. They may not even know who, what town you're from. Online, it could be the same way. But I can tell you this, with all sincerity, from the depths of my heart, with just one tip of your finger, with faith, you can touch the same God that she touched and you can receive the miracle in your life that you want to receive. I want you to notice a few things about this problem that she had. This woman, she had been bleeding for 12 years. That's a long time now. I want to point out something. I don't know whether it means anything or not. This would be a good question for Deborah. 12 years she had been bleeding. Jairus' daughter, how old was she? How old? 12 years old. I don't know. Could it be that this is her mother? Could it be? And in birth, she is still carrying that. I'm not saying that because I don't, this King James Version right here, I don't have the answer to that. But we do know that it was a hemorrhage of some sort. The King James Version calls it an issue of blood. We don't know the name of it, but one thing we do know, that she had been dealing with this for 12 years long years. In other words, it was a perpetual problem. 12 years is a long time to deal with any problem. My mother dealt with shingles for almost 10 years. And it was a perpetual problem. Every day she was dealing with this. Every day that Jairus' daughter had been alive, she was dealing with this problem. She had been dealing with this problem for 4,380 sunrises. For 4,380 sunsets, she had had no relief from this problem. It was a constant thing, whether she came or whether she went. It was a painful problem. I don't know whether it was intermittent or whether it was something that she had to deal with just every day. Because if it had been intermittent, it would have been a, more, a bigger problem to deal with. Why? Because about the time you think you're getting over it and you get out in public. And then it hits you and you have to run to the house. It would have been something bad. And what that will do... That would put you in a prison of your own self. You would incarcerate yourself because of the fears you would be chained to a particular place. 
It's the last thing that you think about when you go to bed at night. It's the first thing you think of of a morning when did you get up. It, had, it was a perpetual problem, just like the pains that we go through in life. Not only that, the Scripture says that she suffered, suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors. How many of you can relate to that? I know there's some in here that you can relate to that. Many doctors. No doubt she went to this one. He would send her to the next one. He would send her to the next one. And pretty soon, one doctor after another. But with all this doctor's help, even though they cared for her, she was never well. The scripture says in spite of all of this, she was receiving nothing for 12 years, and then it says, she had spent all she had, yet instead getting, of getting better, she grew worse. Then something happens. Then Jesus, she meets Jesus. I don't know about you, but when I ran across that right there, it did something to me. Because all through life, we can stumble through life until we meet Jesus and everything seems to change. What changed about here? her? Here she was just a face in the crowd, a nobody from nowhere, but a nobody from nowhere met somebody from somewhere who had enough courage and enough compassion to tell her about Jesus. And when it happened, it totally changed her. What I'm saying to you here today, Russellville, Arkansas, is filled with people who feel that they are a nobody from nowhere and they are just waiting on somebody from somewhere to tell them about Jesus. Is that you? See, I want you to notice something about this reading here. We don't know for sure who told her about Jesus. It might have been Peter's mother that was in the crowd that day. I don't know. Or Peter's mother-in-law. Because, you know, she was sick with a fever. And Jesus came and he touched her. And she was made well. Could it have been the man that his four friends carried him to where Jesus was at and he was teaching in the house and they couldn't get to him. So they cut a hole in the roof and they let him down through the roof. Could it have been him that told her about Jesus? He says, I can just hear him in my own mind. I like to use my imagination. This is some more King James Version. I like to look at it this way. They put him down through the roof and then he walked out. If it was him that told this lady with no name about Jesus, could it be that he told her, I went in there with my back on the bed. But after I back met Jesus, I come out with my bed on my back. Could it have been? Anyway, somebody tells her about Jesus. It doesn't say that they had a PhD, that they were a minister. It didn't even say that they were a leader in the church that told her about Jesus. Somebody told her. I want to tell you something. Russellville, Arkansas is full of people that needs to hear about Jesus. You need to tell about Jesus. You need to tell them that he is a healer, that he is a savior. You need to share that with them. You don't have to know everything. You just have to know what Christ has done to you. I'm trying to hurry. I'm getting running out of time. But then the scripture says that she came to Jesus. It says that she came to him up behind him in the crowd and she touched his cloak. 
See, it's not just enough to hear about Jesus, like I was talking about the illustration I used a while ago. But you need to come to Jesus. But for her, it was not easy to come to Jesus because remember, Jesus is on a 911 call going to Jairus' house. The sirens are blasting. They're on their way. People's gathered around. And she needed to get to him. But people was in her way, holding her back. In the ministry, we hear that all the time. I'll not go to that church because there's nothing but a bunch of hypocrites there. How many of you ever heard that? I hear it all the time. But I'll guarantee you one thing. If they want to go to dinner at Western Sizzling and the whole congregation's in there, they'll go eat. <laughs> if, they need, if they need something from go, go, the grocery store and the whole congregation's there, they'll go get their bread and their, and, and their milk. It don't keep them from doing that. So what is that? That's just a cop out. That's just something that's in between you and Jesus. This woman had a whole multitude of people in between her and Jesus. So she did not let anything keep her from getting to Jesus. So I can see her making her way through the crowd. See, her faith is what got her there as she was making her way through the crowd. The Bible talks about her faith of getting there. As I read this story, I see her faith, and it says, let me back up here, it says that her faith, when she heard about Jesus, she came behind the crowd, and she took his cloak, and Jesus said to her, your faith has healed you. Her faith, when we look at her faith, her faith was imperfect. Think about that with me for just a moment. Because I just told you why her faith was imperfect. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him. In other words, she was trying to get to him, but she come up, in other words, kind of slipped up on Jesus. Arkansas would say sneaked up on him. And I can see her with this imperfect faith. She made her way toward Jesus. See, her life was full of uh, superstition as well. How do I know that? Because she thought if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I can be well. So she never thought about him as much as she thought about his garment. If I can just touch the hem of his garment. When we look at that garment that, that he had on that day, it was a much, much like a tallit that we have seen. Four square corners and on, the, on the corners that had some tassels hanging down. Blue and white threads. And I can see her. As she's making her way on her knees through that razorback crowd, crawling. And I can see her. She can't hardly see where she's going, but she's reaching. She keeps reaching. She keeps reaching. She keeps reaching. And eventually, she touches just the tip of that garment that Jesus had on. And when she touched the tip of that garment, the power of Almighty God, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, he felt something go out of his body, out of that garment, down to the tip of that tassel, from the tip of that tassel, from the tip of her finger, it began to run up her arm. It went inside of her body, down through, and it completely encapsulated her body. And the Bible says that she 
immediately was well. She was healed. Why? Because she had an encounter with Jesus. I'm here to tell you today, this old preacher here that we sang about today, when you touch Jesus, you will feel him in your body and you will never be the same in Jesus' name. (laughs) And Jesus... I like this part. She felt Jesus, but Jesus felt it as well. Oh, man. Aren't you glad that he has a never-ending supply? Just look across the world today. How many people is reaching out just for a touch? We come to this place here this morning just to get a touch of Jesus. Isn't it good that Jesus, he never runs out. If you wanted to feel Jesus this morning, you felt him in this place right here while they were worshiping him. If you want to feel Jesus today, it's not all over with. All you have to do is just reach out and touch him and he will sense your need and he will touch your life as well. He felt it go out of him, so he turned around in the crowd and he said, who touched my clothes? I can hear the disciples What do you mean who touched you? Look at the people that's here. Everybody's touching you, Jesus. But Jesus said, that wasn't no ordinary touch that I felt. That was a touch that wasn't just usual contact. It wasn't just an accidental bump that I fed, but this was a touch of desperation. This was a touch of faith. And this was a touch that if I don't touch him, if I don't touch him, it's going to be all over for me. I've never had what she had. But spiritually, I've been where she's at. And I said, Lord, if I don't feel your touch, it's all over for me. I remember when my life was going crazy. I was so far away from God. And I cried out to him in desperation. I said, Lord, if you don't touch me, it's over. You know, sometimes it's just like a hot rod. I'm not talking about one of them fast ones. I'm talking about like a hot rod coming down from heaven. And you touch it. And when you touch it, it just seems to come down your arms and go through your entire body. And all of a sudden, the power of God has just totally cleansed you through and through and you feel so clean. It's more than Mr. Clean getting a hold of you. It's the master cleaner, the blood of Jesus Christ. When it flows through you, it will totally change you. In desperation, he said, who touched me? And the woman, knowing what had happened after she had received her healing, She came and fell at his feet, trembling with fear, and told him the whole truth. I want to ask you here today, are you being totally truthful with God? 
A whole truth and nothing but the truth saying, God, this is me. Not like he don't already know you. He knows you inside and out, upside down and right side up. He knows you. He's just waiting on a confession. So she tells him the truth. This is my closing statement. After she tells him the truth, the scripture says he called her daughter. He said, daughter, your faith has healed you. I want you to remember this, that at one time, she was a lady with no name. Missed nobody from nowhere. But she has an encounter with Jesus, and he calls her daughter. Here's what I want you to get out of it. See, when she comes to Jesus, according to the Jewish law, she was unclean. She wasn't even supposed to have been among people. But she, here she is trying to get a hold of the King of Kings and King of, and the Lord of Lords. Defiled. She was shameful. Wasn't even supposed to be there in the presence of a rabbi. And now she's got family. Now she has a home. She is claimed his daughter. He heals her. And now She's in relationship. That's good stuff. She goes from an outsider to being a daughter in relationship. And he says, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. What a beautiful word. Shalom. Meaning peace, peace of mind, wholeness. <coughs> uh, one I haven't even noticed as many times as I have went to the Strongs and looked at this. And I want to put it right here. He says, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Shalom or peace means all the essential pieces is joined together. So he said, daughter, your faith has healed you. All the essential pieces is joined together Be free from your suffering. In life, it's like a puzzle sometimes. It's a struggle. With all of this peace, even though we know that we're well, we know that we're better. Sometimes it just seems that all the pieces has come together. The essential pieces. Have you ever just felt like that you were falling apart? Some days I feel like that my life is just like this, There's a rubber band and it's stretched to all the tension that it can stand before it breaks. 
But then all the essential pieces begins to come together. But I want to tell you today, when it comes together, you will feel like you're not just one in the crowd. You're not an outsider. You're an insider because you've touched Jesus. All of our altar workers that signed up, I want you to come up here and be with Sister Irma. I want you to come. All of you. Because it's important that you don't leave like you came. If you come to service this morning and you didn't know where that you were going to get your next meal, and I knew about it and I provided for you to go get your next meal, and you didn't accept it, what good would it do you? No good. So what I'm saying this morning, if you know that you need a touch from heaven and you need to leave different than you came, I want you to allow us to join together with you and break the powers of the enemy as he tries to control your life. Because we have a group of people up here that is concerned about you having your experience with Jesus. We're not going to pour some kind of oil upon you that you're going to make you a freak. We're not going to do that. We're not going to dip you in something that just to try to make you like us. We're not going to do that. But what we want to do, we want to help you get through the place that you're in where you won't feel like You're one in the crowd, and you have no relief. Everyone standing. If you're one of those people this morning, I want you to come. There comes one. Is there others? You'll come. We we want to lay hands on you and pray for you. We want to help you through life. We want to encourage you. Because we are all in this thing together. Would you come? If you don't have a need, I would like for everybody that's in this church to come fall in these altars with us. If you're not able to kneel at these altars, just find you a seat. And we want to take our church, our family, our nation before God. So join with us this morning. Would you please come and join with us as we pray for these others? Yes. It brings a ray of light just to have a touch, Lord, from you. Just to have a touch, Lord. Yeah.